create a change internally in an organization, which is what a sale of any product is, you've got to disrupt and realign their way of thinking. Understand that there are multiple decision makers and how to find them. You have to be amazing at building relationships and rapport. Uh, establishing and connecting and building trust. Hello, Sales Nation. I am your host, Will Barron, and welcome to another episode of the Salesman Podcast. On this episode, we're talking about long-term, more complex sales, and our guest is Shane Gibson. We start off the show with Shane explaining that to close a complex sale, you don't need a different skill set necessarily than a smaller, uh, shorter-term sale. What you need is additional skills, which we come on to throughout the show. And that's the whole basis of this episode. Shane also shares his thoughts on conforming to the buying process of the big corporate that you're dealing with, rather than trying to force them down the line and the sales funnel that you have personally. You have to play their game a little bit more. And we wrap up the show by talking about the fact that across the business world, for sales professionals, if you're gonna really thrive, you need to become not just a salesperson, but you need to understand business. You need to be able to have a business to business conversation with your prospects. You need to be able to have an executive to an executive conversation with the C-suite when you're dealing with them. And that makes up the crux of the show. Shane himself is an international speaker, sales trainer, author, and he is number five on the Forbes list of top social selling people in the world. Social selling comes into the show a little bit, You can find out more about Shane over at closingbigger.net. Everything else we talk about is available in the show notes over at salesman.red. And with that, let's jump into today's episode. Hi, Shane, and welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Thanks for having me. You are more than welcome, sir. So today we're going to talk about the, uh, the bigger, the more complex sale. It's something that I am more familiar with. And so I'm, because what we're going to do is we're going to go back uh, I'm going to be thinking back of all the mistakes I've made over the years when we uh, go through some of your knowledge today. So that's going to be intriguing for me. And uh, a question that is going to either <laughs> lead to a couple more questions or cut the show very short. Does managing a complex longer term sale require a different skill set than what a shorter term does? It does. I wouldn't say it's different as much as it's an additional skill set. And I think there's there's in our managing complex business relationship system, um, we really talk about three levels of selling. Uh, the first level is really pressure selling, feature and benefit selling, order taking selling. That tends to be transactional, smaller items, um, not a ton of product knowledge, uh, quick impulse buys, not a big risk on behalf of the buyer. Um, you're going in to buy a pair of shoes. I, you know, whether you go for the brown loafers or the black ones is not going to be a life ending career decision, Um, you know, and so that's that level of selling. And you can see that a lot in retail. You can see it a lot in, uh, you know, it really on the telephone. Um, And then you move into the next level, which is multiple contact selling, after service selling and relationship building selling or what I like to just call relationship marketing focused level of selling. And so relationship sellers are you know, we buy from people them be, because they have a good product knowledge, but also because we've got a great personal connection with them. But you wouldn't necessarily buy a brand new CRM system and spend a million dollars for your company's CRM because you like the guy. <laughs> uh, and, and he was able to talk about features and benefits. You got to move to the next level. And this is really the next level where, where complex selling happens. And that's customer and solution focused selling. And this is very much the sales process you follow is the bu- is the buying strategy that your customer uses. And so that level is really a whole additional set of scales. So you uh, skills. So you still need, you know, feature benefit selling, you need to know to uh, identify buying signals, you got to be a good relationship builder, but then there's a whole other suite of skills on top of that in customer and solution focused selling that aren't necessarily necessary in the other levels. Cuz because you've been in complex selling, you know that you know, to be a complex salesperson, you have to have good project management skills. That's not something you necessarily need at the first level, right? Um, you need to be a good customer trainer because you're going to train them in your solutions. You're educating them on how your business works. Um, you got to be an awesome presenter. Uh, you got to be a team leader because it's a team sell. Uh, and you got to be a good p- politician because the average complex sale um, is going to have 5.6 decision makers based upon, you know, sort of recent studies. 
And so these are all things that you don't have to worry about if you're the average salesperson um, working in a call center uh, or a car dealership. So I know it's a really long answer uh, to a short question, uh, but yeah, the answer is, yeah, you need an additional set of skills. It's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. So there's a whole ton to go out here, Shane, already, because I can 100% from our medical device sales days, and we were putting deals together in some cases, you know, a million, two million across the, the whole of the trust for, for whole theaters rather than individual uh, pieces of equipment. And I've never thought about it like this before, so I'm really interested. I for sure was project managing and I probably shouldn't have been because I've got no practice training or anything <laughs> other than the experience I picked up along the way. Uh, again, training, I always spent a lot of time in theatres with the theatre staff, with the surgeons, training them specifically how to use all the equipment. So some of that is features benefits. Some of that is your past experience and, and bringing people in and again, project managing all that. Team leader, totally appreciate that. And the politics the NHS is ridiculous of, well, to dumb it down, you've got the surgeon who wants the equipment that you're selling because I've only ever worked for the, the top companies within the industry. Then you have a procurement manager that doesn't care what you're selling. They just want to buy the cheapest end of it. You've got them fighting. And you've got to be a mediator in the middle of it all as, as well as deal with the politics. So the, the place to start of all of this, I guess, for anyone else who's listening now, in this B2B complex sales world, they are probably just having the same realizations that I am, that they're probably doing a lot more than what they think they're doing. Where's the yeah, best absolutely. place to start in getting, becoming better at this? Is there one of these skills that is fundamental and progresses across many of them? What would be the base of the pyramid? Uh, the base of the pyramid for me in a complex sale is, is a complex sale and where uh, managing complex business relationships uh, was a program uh, that was actually developed by uh, Knowledge Brokers International, which is a company, it's a family business founded by my father. And it was originally built for two organizations, Siemens Industry and Transport Division in South Africa. So they sell like turbines and everything you need to build like a hydro dam. You can imagine that's like a five year <laughs> sales cycle. And then BMW Fleet. And so BMW Fleet was also the other organization that used this process originally. And one of the core things we identified, the place we like to start is just two areas. One is to understand that there are multiple decision makers and how to find them. And the second is to understand the stages of business relationships and know that you need to go through those stages with each of those players. So if you think about those two things, you got to develop a map of who these core decision makers are or those who influence the sale. And then your goal is not just to close the deal. It's really to go from stranger to trusted advisor with each of these power players. And, and that's sort of the two key sets. Um, and in, in our program, what we laid out is uh, we laid out really six key uh, characters. And these characters, uh, whether it's uh, Miller Hyman's system, uh, whether um, it's Mastering the Complex Sale, um, which is another great book on the topic, uh, or the more latest book, The Challenger Sale or Challenger Customer, they all kind of talk about these characters. They just call them different things. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to kind of go through them what we call them. The, the first one is the navigator. And the navigator plots a path and a course. That's what a navigator does. They're typically uh, higher up in an organization. They won't necessarily sell for you, but they'll tell you who's for you, who's against you, uh, what what your you know what your competitors are saying, um, and and what their buying process is, and what their leadership structure looks like, and they'll often help you for their own political gain or an altruistic reason. Like if they know if you got in the organization, what you're selling could actually help, um, you know, people who go to your hospital, uh, or it could help the organization grow. And now eventually, if it goes well, the navigator will stop and say, hey, I helped Shane. You know, I'm actually want to introduce Shane. <laughs> but if it doesn't go well, no one will know yeah. they're involved. You know? and so that's, that tends to be the navigator. And then the next person is the ruler. And the ruler, obviously, um, is the decision maker or decision makers. So depending upon if it's an autocratic, democratic, or by consensus leadership style, you'll have one person who really is the end decision maker. You'll have a group of people who have to 100% to agree or you have a more democratic discussion. And so there'll be an individual or group of individuals who actually can rubber stamp the deal. And so that's the next group I want to identify. And one key tip with this group is you typically only get one chance to get in front of them, maybe two if you're lucky. So you have to have your stuff together. And they think in bottom line and results. Don't get down into the weeds with them on all the details and the technical specs of your product. 
uh, they'll glaze over. It, it is the ROI on your solution. And then the third group is your users. So these are the people who implement. So in your case, in selling medical services uh, products or medical products, you've got the actual doctor who's using it, but also even the nursing and support staff are users because they're responsible for helping implement. If I was selling a CRM, there's like three groups of users. You've got your CTO and the tech staff. You've got your VP of sales and sales management, which is another group. And then you've got your staff who actually use it. And how many times have I seen staff actually completely mess up a good deal <laughs> by refusing to use a new technology because they didn't feel included. And so then you've got the fourth is the protector. And this guy is, you know, for lack of a, you know, as salespeople, we might call these guys bean counters <laughs> uh, or, yeah, you know, uh, accountants, uh, R&D teams, uh, you know, it might be um, a CTO, someone who typically can't say yes, but they can say no. This is the guy who writes the RFP in many cases. So you've got the protector. And you've got to figure out their line of logic. And if you're going to negotiate with them, you've got to first negotiate with their logic, how they're forming a decision. Then the fifth one is your opposer. They don't like you because you look like their brother-in-law. That's why. <laughs> or because they want their friend to get a deal. Or they don't like the executive who said they should do business with you. And so this is more of an emotional strategy. And the last one, number six, is your contributor or your champion. So the contributor is a second salesperson. This might be the golfing buddy of the CEO, or it might be someone internally who's part of the ruling group who's actually helping sell your solution and make things happen inside. And so these are your six people that you need, or six groups of people. Now, sometimes your ruler is also your navigator, right? So they could be combined. But the key factor here is um, you need to figure out who these people are. And so if you're if you've closed the deal and you get your first check and you still only know the ruler, your long-term prospects of retaining the customer are low. So even if you can get the deal without knowing the power player network, you need to make sure you expand into it. And so that's that's really the first skill set. Let me just go through some of these, Shane, to put yeah. them into context and to get them into context with my own brain as well. And I'll go back to medical devices, yeah. uh, since as that was the example I give at the beginning. Um. So the navigator for us would be middle management, so theater staff or theater management in that they had no real say, but they could introduce you and, and that kind of thing. The ruler would always be the CFO of the hospital. Again, high level conversations with them. And that's something I really sucked at at first. I'd go into them and be like, well, we're going to save more patients' lives and we're going to do this. And all they cared about was that the, our product would use less consumables. So it would be it'd pay for itself in five years time. Things like that. Yeah, um, that's something I had to. I learned the hard way on, on a couple of occasions. Users were again surgeons, theatre staff, and interestingly, the surgeons then, as you said before, would also um, could be the opposers or champions, depending on where they'd been trained, who was paying for the trips away at the weekend, company wise, to take them to conferences and that kind of thing. Uh, so, yeah, so they were all in that mix. And then the protectors, which I said at the beginning of the show with the NHS, was the procurement managers who, again, didn't really care what was going on as long, well, as long as they could, I'm probably going to offend a load of them now, not that they'd be listening to a show like this, but they wanted as minimum work as possible. So changing service was a huge deal to them. Um, and so they would put down pressure from, from their perspective to stop that happening. Opposers, again, surgeons that would be uh, looked after by different companies or trained on different equipment. Also, EBME, which is the medical um, uh, technicians, they wouldn't want new equipment coming in because they have to safety check it and, and all these kind of things as well. And then the champions, obviously, the people we're looking for. At the top of the show, because uh, I think we can identify them, and I, I've never done this step-by-step, -step, so <laughs> I'm learning a load here myself. Bef after we've identified and identified these people, perhaps we've had introductions. At the top of the show, you mentioned the customer buying strategy. How yeah. does that fit into all of this? Because I think a lot of salespeople think that they are leading the sale. Everything's following their structure. But in my experience, that's usually not the case. No, because it's really an exercise in organizational development. It's understanding that in order to um, create... Uh, change internally in organization, which is what a sale of any product is. You've got to disrupt and realign their way of thinking um, to some degree. 
And so you've got to figure out what is it going to take for them to be willing to disrupt and realign their way of thinking. And so I, you know, a big thing, really important um, in the complex selling process and managing complex business relationships is um, the needs analysis approach, is really getting good at the art of asking questions. And I've got a specific process for teaching people how to interview customers. And I kind of like to say it this way, is that you know the story, but you ask the questions so you get the customer to narrate the story in a way they think it's their story. And so, and within that, you're developing credibility, but you're also understanding core buying motivators. Um, what scares the heck out of them about doing business with you? Uh, and, and really through that process, um, getting permission to sell to them, but really understanding what their key strategy is, what's important to them, who are the key power players that have to buy in, um, how do they implement a solution? All of these things are, are really key. Um, I'm amazed how many sales professionals, um, you know, won't understand the decision-making process for vetting vendors and they're in there pitching and writing an RFP. Uh, they don't understand payment terms, uh, how their lawyers work. Uh, their history with other vendors, um, all of these things, right? Um, you know, little things, but huge things. Like, for instance, <laughs> I did a lot of work with Ford, Ford Motor Company. And whenever I went out with the executives of Ford Motor Company, I wasn't allowed to buy them anything and they weren't allowed to buy anything for me. So we could go for a drink, um, not, you know, not around the car dealership, obviously, but uh, at a hotel, you know, whatever, at a conference, yeah. they can have a cocktail or they can have dinner with you or they could go to a theme park and you could meet them there, but they had to pay for themselves and you had to pay for you. And so there's like even little things like that, which could really mess up a deal or offend a client. If you're not digging deeper and finding out what their core culture is, what their buying strategy is, what their process is. And, and so this is something that I think is, it's really, really key is identifying this through a really good needs analysis approach. And then what I also find is that most sales professionals, um, only do a needs analysis to figure out how they're going to get you, <laughs> right? And it's not about actually, so it's about leaving your, having an agenda and knowing the story you want the customer to tell, but then leaving that agenda at the door and being a true listener, you know, really suspending judgment um, because you'll, you'll learn and hear new things. You might even hear things about new solutions you never thought of. Remember, a lot of, a lot of great products have come out of customer problems. And so none of that will be apparent to someone who's just trying to hear language from you that says you need my product. And, and so and I think when I Shane, talk about let me follow just go dive into that. How much yeah. of a complex sale is down to the the being a firm, rigid, analytical ROI on this project is going to take this amount of time and we're going to do it and it's not going to cause you much pain versus because most people could come up with that on a spreadsheet, not most people, but it's, it's doable versus there's a lot of soft skills in answering questions, building rapport, getting, getting to the bottom of things. How much of that contributes to the, so, the close in the end, or whether it's months or well, years it, that you're talking about? And it goes back to kind of a question I asked in my seminars or, or state my seminars is, you know, we, when Trevor Green and I wrote the book Closing Bigger over a decade ago and interviewed people who closed deals over a million dollars and said, what do they do differently? We discovered that the one thing you need to know about closing big deals is there's more than one thing you need to know about closing big deals. And so my answer to your question is yes, not either or, is we go back to those multiple skill sets of a complex deal closer. You have to be amazing at building relationships and rapport, uh, establishing a connecting and building trust. Trevor and I defined uh, closing as creating an environment where an act of faith can take place. And faith is based upon trust and credibility. Now trust and credibility both comes in the analytical side, but also in the relationship side. Um, and if you don't like someone, it doesn't matter how awesome their analytical side is, you're not going to do business with them. It doesn't mean you have to love them like your next best friend, but at the end of the day, there has to be a level of rapport and trust and credibility. And so there are those two things going on at the same time, is that there's, you know, to create that environment and active faith can take place, you have to have trust and credibility, and that is built upon both the details of the relationship and the details of the deal. Now, I will say one thing. Um, years ago, one of my clients was a company called InfoSat Telecommunications. So they sold the original satellite uplink system to the Canadian military going into Kandahar in Afghanistan, which I think is still in place today. 
And so you can imagine that that's kind of a big deal. That's kind of a big deal. Like you, you kind of want to make the right decision as the military executive and buying team to buy yeah. the right satellite telecommunications system and have the right team do the install. And so one of the things that I said, so this was a huge analytical deal with all the military brass. He goes, it was, but you know what? The agreement was that thick. And so was the technical specs. And neither myself as the vice president of sales or the senior procurement officers actually knew what those said. <laughs> like at some point it was so much technical jargon and it was handled by so many people that at some point I looked them in the eye and they looked me in the eye and we basically shook on it. And it was about the relationship and trust that was built. Now, with that said, in a complex sale, there is immersion. So the senior, to senior, the CEOs may be talking and the, and the VPs of sales may be talking and the product teams may be talking from the different companies. And then the salesperson is actually facilitating all these guys talking to each other mm -hmm. to get the deal done. So once again, yeah, on the product front end and the CTOs talking and the technical engineers, communications engineer, in electrical engineers talking, it's all analytical. But as you move up to the other parts of the team interacting, it becomes very relationship and political based. So it is, depending on the size of the deal, it's why they, you know, when that stat is, I think, almost undershooting in a large deal, when you get over a million dollars or a million pounds uh, in a sale, um, I, I would argue that there's a lot more than 5.6 people involved. You know, there's probably a dozen, maybe more, not including the users that you vet or you know, in interview, for instance. And, and getting really practical practical into this, and we'll come on to your uh, professional sales certificate and, and the things that you can offer personally, but does a lot of this come down to just becoming more rounded as a business person rather than just being involved in sales in the, you know, the ability to read, uh, you know, P&L, that kind Absolutely. of thing? Absolutely. And is that something that you see lacking from salespeople? Totally. I, I, I think it's I think it's 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 quite hilarious that uh, not hilarious. It's sad, actually, and hilarious is I'll have somebody come to me and they'll say, how do I sell the CEOs or get into a boardroom or or how do you know, how do you get to these board of trade functions and connect with the CFO and develop rapport? Like, I, I don't seem to have anything in common with them. And I'm like, well, let's sit down and list the top eight periodicals they read every week. Are you reading those? Are you reading the periodicals that CFOs and CEOs are reading every week so you know what's going on in their world? Uh, are there terms in there? Like if you don't understand mergers and acquisitions, um, are you taking an online course about it? <laughs> uh, you know, if you want to sell into the insurance industry solutions, are you going to their conferences and hearing what's going on, even from a compliance area that you'll never affect your sale, but <laughs> if you know it, it helps you have a conversation with them. And so are you a an expert student at the life of your target market. And in most people, most salespeople are like, no, I don't have time. I barely have time to fill in my notes in Salesforce. I got to make another call. But they have time to, you know, they know the the whole, um, you know, they, they, they're up to date on all their Netflix shows, you know, and they, <laughs> and all these other things. And, they, you know, and they've got four hobbies, but they don't have time to learn about their customer. And so there's my thought is that, yeah, you need to become a business person. You need to think like a senior decision maker if you want to sell to senior decision makers. And the way you do that is you've got to kind of drink the same Kool-Aid as they do. You've got to go to the same conferences. You've got to read the same periodicals. You've got to understand their business. Uh, and I totally agree, massively agree. And is this the difference between a casual salesperson who will do well and someone who is going to become a superstar and rise the ranks, VP sales uh, upwards. It it is to a large degree. I, I believe it is because you've you've got to have, you've got to build th those skills. Um, you know, I, I go into we talked about master of a basic selling skills, but you've also got to, like I said, you've got to also be great at man managing projects. You've got to be an awesome negotiator. Like you've got to be a really good negotiator. Um, you've got to be a good analyst, right? You're going to ask great questions and interpret data and figure out what that means with the customer. Um, and then you've got to be that trainer. You've got to be uh, awesome at making good decisions. Uh, you've you got to be a great networker. And so all these things are, are skill sets, which the great thing about all these things I've listed is most of them are actually skill sets you can develop. They're not inherent talents or strengths on a personality style basis. I've seen every personality style under the sun succeed at large deals. It was the ability to be obsessed with the basics and get good at them. And so, and I think that is, that is the, dif the difference. Now, with that said, it is also about playing to your strengths. 
And so if you are an amazing relationship builder, an amazing presenter, and an amazing negotiator, but you're not so great on the details and developing project plans and analyzing data, that's where your team skills come into place. That's where you, you get good at surrounding yourself with a team of people. I've got a friend of mine who's um, you know, arguably, let's just say he's in the top 10 in Canada for IBM for sale, selling. So these are, these are not you know, seven figure, these are sometimes eight figure sales that they're making, right? These are big deals. And when I asked him about working at a startup, he said, I don't think a startup or even like a mid-sized company possesses the resources necessary for a guy like me to close deals. Interesting. So he's relaying it to the fact that his toolkit that IBM provides him allows him to close, you know, a nine, ten million dollar deal. So there is that that bit to think about as well. And do you see this as a trend moving forward as well? That you'll have a salesperson, then you'll have someone in sales enablement. Perhaps they'll have closer ties with marketing. They'll have someone to do some of the admin work for them because that's what I've seen in the jobs I've had that was moving towards that. But people seem split on it when I asked them on the show. Well, we have two trends and it depends on the type of selling because someone who works in a call center or a car dealership um, will tell you the opposite, that actually technology, uh, you know, some guy walking around the car, car dealership with an iPad in his hand at a BMW dealership um, actually can now do your, you know, your finance approval and set up and everything else that a business manager used to do in the back office. So they have, with technology, has pushed the back office into the hands mm. of the salesperson in a lot of instances. And so that interaction can all be done through an interface and they, they can make decisions enabled by technology, artificial intelligence, uh, bots now are, you know, are, are the latest thing that you'll see that are going to support the sales process. And so all of these things, so that's a truth. And the other truth is when you're selling a solution that impacts more than one person or a group of people. So the more people that impacts, if it, if it affects the division, then you're going to want the, the sales manager and the salespeople and the support are going to want to be involved. If it affects um, an entire company, then you're going to find that senior and brass and several committees and multiple divisions are going to want to be involved. So the more people it impacts, often the more people are going to be involved in that decision-making process. And if that sale gets complex, the salesperson almost always needs a support team to tackle that. Um, and so there's two worlds happening. More salespeople being empowered way more to do way more on the front lines on their own, especially outside salespeople. But there's also in complex selling, I believe that there will always be a need for, and if that sale gets complex, definitely, the definitely. salesperson I feel like we're only scratching the surface in this. That. So we'll have to have you back on to dive into some of the more, uh, some of the specifics in more detail. But Absolutely. to wrap up this That's part it. of the show, Shane, I've got a couple of questions to ask everyone that comes on. First one, who is the world's greatest salesperson? Ah, well, I'm going to have to say my dad, Bill Gibson. Uh, and I know that's, that's for me, I have never seen um, someone be able to sell and develop relationships um, rescue deals in boardrooms that I thought were long dead. Uh, and even after they kick us out of the boardroom, he finds a way to get back in <laughs> to somebody else's office and, and, and close the deal. And so now with that said, uh, he's my number one mentor, of course. Um, he's been a speaking and training since uh, the early 80s, spoken to over a million people on sales. His name is Bill Gibson. You find him at Bill Gibson one on Twitter, or the, not like the number one. Um, so I would say that first one is, is, is my father. Um, and, and I think that, you know, in my own personal experience. Um, the other uh, amazing speaker, I never met him personally, um, but I've, I've interacted with his son a number of times, was Zig Ziglar. And Zig Ziglar was really the grandfather of sales training. And his son is still out there carrying the torch. Um, and some other great people I know are involved in their organization. And so those are some great salespeople. Um, but I, I would say that, you know, today, I think that probably some of the world's, you know, greatest salespeople um, are, are community builders, uh, our politicians, I hate to say it, uh, you know, the ability to uh, sell an idea, an intangible is an incredible skill. So, um, you know, what? You know, another great salesperson, and I'm a bit of a, you know, social media, as you know, I'm into social selling, and I've been following since the beginning of his career, but an incredible salesperson is Gary Vaynerchuk. Mm -hmm. And Gary, Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V is an awesome hustler. But I would say my personal life, Bill Gibson, my father, is the best salesperson I've ever worked with. Um, a close second uh, would be Dr. Dennis Covier, um, author of How to Hire the Right Person, incredible sales guy. And these guys sell training, so I work next to. And the third one 
um, who uh, is incredible, is a guy by the name of Minto Roy, who's here based here in Canada. So those are three guys. One thing they have in common is um, tenacity um, and a sense of curiosity. Like there's there's this sense of curiosity on, I wonder how <laughs> I could get in here, or I wonder who sold that guy that product. And they're just always curious. But so those are the three big salespeople that I know that influence my life the most. Awesome. Okay, next one. What motivates you personally to close more deals? Um, eating, typically eating, uh, food, uh, uh, you know, shelter. No, I, I, it's a, it's a game. It is. I love what motivates me to close a deal, and I'll back off a deal if I don't feel it in my heart. I'm a pretty emotional guy. What motivates me to close a deal is the fact that I know genuinely that what I have to offer is gonna change their life and their business. And that for me is a big one. And it's one of the reasons why I've always worked for myself. You know, other than you know a couple stints consulting with organizations, building their sales process and whatnot on a full-time basis over the years, I've always worked for myself because I've always felt very comfortable that in my heart I could deliver. And if I felt that, I could close the deal. And, and Shane, so I think that goes let me back jump to, in there. Go ahead, yeah. I wanna dive into, because the first thing you said was to eat of course you were joking but yeah obviously once you've got your your hierarchy of needs sorted and need shelter that kind of thing food what what do you spend your money on what motivates you from that perspective to be successful you know what what are you working towards what are you aiming towards what you're building yeah i mean i think for me um you know the sales and the training business has shifted and so what 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 is going to evolve from me. What I'm investing my money in now more and more is digital. So I'm rebuilding a couple of our sites, which will launch soon. Um, we've already got an online course in partnership with Langara College because I think that's the future of sales training and sales development is self-directed learning. You know, an individual salesperson saying, I want to get trained, I'll pay for it, or they're going to do the course on their own. And look, so we've we'll, got a we'll come on to the course program. in a second. I, well, I, you've got, I'll, I'll dive into that. But you personally, you personally, out of business. So out of business, okay, so number one, um, I love what I do, so it is my life. And so I am okay. gonna invest in that business so I can keep doing it, as sort of the long answer to the short question. Nice. And to me personally, it's people and experiences. And so I'm not a, don't tell this to my car clients, but I'm not a big car guy. Uh, you know, I like cars, but I, I, as long as it gets me A to B and you know, it, it doesn't embarrass me when I pull up to a client's office, I'm happy. Um, but I love, I love hiking, I love kayaking. Um, I love camping. I love the wilderness. I like skiing. I like snowshoeing. It's a good thing because I live in Canada. Um, <laughs> you know, I love travel, uh, you know, Thailand, uh, South America, uh, going to South Africa to visit my family. Uh, my mom and dad live there. They're Canadian, but they live there. So creating experiences. Um, and I, I forget who said this, but I, I want to, when I'm old, have way more memories than unmet dreams. And that's my goal. And so for me, it's people and experiences. And that's what makes me tick is, is more relationships, genuine connection, personal growth. Um, I'm, uh, I've got a mentor named Fred Shadian who I've been studying uh, Filipino martial arts, stick fighting, knife fighting with since I've been in my early 20s. And that's a big passion of mine. So I spend my money and my time I spend my money on giving myself enough time to do those things. And I think that's the answer is people and experiences. Um, and that's what, that's what makes me tick, you know, but on the other side, I do love my business. So I do invest in that and I see the future is digital. It's online learning, but that doesn't mean I don't want you to hire me to do a keynote at your next conference. You know, I also like doing that, you know, good stuff. So final one for me before he tells a little bit more about uh, what you do and what you alluded to then, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at sales? Ah, uh, hmm. Better at sales. That's interesting. Um, I was thinking, I was, I was pretty good when I was younger. I, I, I got to think, <laughs> I've improved. But I'm thinking, like, what's the one thing that I would try, tell myself? Um, I think that, you know, to, to really get more disciplined with follow up. And another extension of that, and I actually wrote a, a, a blog post for LinkedIn's sales blog last year on uh, if I were 22, and it was the same kind of question. And the other one was, be more reckless in business and less reckless with relationships. And I think that is something that my younger self 
I didn't spend enough time following up and, and taking care of relationships when I met a really awesome people to, to stay in touch and see how I can help them. Um, and yet I was a bit conservative with like my career or with business deals I was doing. And so I would say, you know, using a baseball analogy is, you know, swing for the back of the fence when you're young in business, but in relationships, realize that those relationships you're starting can be viable for a lifetime. So honor them way more. And I think those are the two things that I would even tell a young sales professional is that you don't know that you might hate your sales job right now, but the 10 guys you're working with beside you in the call center that you're building relationships with and the five clients that you just talked to, you know, this week that you, that you started relationships with may finance your first business in 10 years from now. And, and so, you know, you got to remember that. And so that that would be my advice. That is incredible advice. That's that's probably the best answer I've had on the show this year for sure. And with that, awesome. Shane, I want you to tell us a little bit about your professional sales certificate, which you alluded to before, uh, and everything else that you offer as well. Give us a give us a rundown. Yeah, a rundown. Um, the professional sales certificate program is a four month course I built in par partnership with Langara Continuing Studies. Uh, which is a division of Langara College, which is a degree-granting university college uh, here in Canada. If someone was interested in checking out the course, it's the A to Z in selling. So if you want to learn all three levels of selling, right from the customer and solution focused right up to, right down um, to sort of the transactional type selling, covers the whole thing. And so you can just go to langara.ca forward slash sales. Uh, and you'll find the course there. That's the best place to find the information. Uh, you can also hit closingbigger.net, which is my website, because there's a ton of information there on it. Uh, and, and so that's the, the, the online program, and we've had incredible results. Um, I originally kind of thought, this online sales thing won't work, because people love me, and they want to meet me in person, and I don't know if this will work. And I, I was convinced I was awesome, and that's what was making things work. And then, and then we built this online course, and I, I only do like a live webinar once a month, and the rest is all done by the students. They're having better results, so I'm starting to question my training skills. But uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I think it's the motivation of the individuals going mm -hmm. through it. So it's a great course. Um, and uh, the other one is, of course, I do keynote speeches at conferences. And so my background, of course, is in large, complex deals, um, as well as social selling, which is an area which I've written two books on social media, one called Sociable and one called Guerrilla Social Media Marketing. And so I do a lot of talks on social selling. So if you're looking for really complex deal skills, negotiations, old school sales stuff at the enterprise level, or social selling, I cover that. And you can find more information at closingbigger.net. Uh, and so that's kind of the two things uh, that I offer, uh, along with in-depth boot camps. So if you want a two, three, four day program to really overhaul your whole sales process, that's something that we do. Amazing stuff. Yeah. Shane, I want to thank you for your time. I just want to, we'll link to all that in the show notes over at salesman.red as well. I want to thank you for your time. And I want to thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Hey, fantastic. Have a great week. And there we have it. Shane, thank you for joining me on the Salesman Podcast. I really appreciate it, mate. Some real food for thought in this episode if you are going after those bigger, more complex sales. And to be fair, that's probably where the money is. They're probably the more prestigious sales jobs. That's probably where if you're not doing that, that's where you should be heading. With all that said, I want to thank you, Sales Nation, for tuning in. As always, there'd be no show if you guys didn't download and listen to these episodes. And with that, I will speak with you all again tomorrow. <laughs>